Psalms chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the adventure. When I consider thy heavens, the work of <coughs> thy fingers, the moon and the source which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? <coughs> Thank you, Daniel Moses. Good job reading the scripture this morning. I appreciate Brother Philip leading us in a fine way in our singing. We're certainly glad to see each and everyone here on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Today, as we consider the words we've just heard, and we think about God and His majesty and His great power and the tremendous creation that He has made, when we consider the heavens, the works of His hands, Indeed, like David the psalmist, we are led to ask, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? David said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, when we think about what a great and masterful and mighty God that we have, and then we consider the concern that he has for us as human beings, David said, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? When we consider these matters today, my friends, we are led to ask, What about the precious soul of man? Each and every one of us has a soul that is an inward part of our being that is going to live beyond this world after this body has long gone back to the dust, our souls, our spirits will be in eternity. In Matthew, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 28, we read of the great concern that God has over each and every one of us. In Matthew 10, in verse 28, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Here the Lord warns us not to fear man, but to fear, that is to respect and to reverence God. And then he goes on to speak of God's tremendous concern, even over the details of our being. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. This truth here emphasizes an important point, and that is that God knows things about us that we do not even realize about ourselves. That we cannot count the number of hairs upon our head. Although as time goes on, I speak for myself, it may be easier to do that than it used to be. Still, we cannot count the number of hairs upon our head. God knows that number. He knows the very details of our being. As we think this morning about the precious soul of man, that is, of people, each and every one of us, let's consider, first of all, the immortality of the soul. Our purpose today is to impress on our minds the value before God of our souls, the great value that our souls have. First of all, the immortality of the soul. The fact that the soul is going to go beyond this world and this life. In the book of Job, the 32nd chapter, verse number 8, 
But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. There is a spirit in man. There is something within us that is even greater than the physical body. And this is why Jesus said we are to fear God and not man, because man can kill the body, but only God can destroy both soul and body in hell. Then we turn to the book of Daniel, the seventh chapter, verse number 15. Daniel the prophet says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head trouble me. He speaks of being troubled in his spirit, which was in the midst of his body. The idea is that, like a letter in an envelope, the spirit or soul is placed within the body. The body is like the sheath. The body is the envelope into which the soul is inserted by God. One might argue, well, I cannot see my soul and my spirit. I cannot see it. Therefore, it does not exist. But there are many things that we cannot see visibly with the naked eye. We cannot see electricity. We may see the effects of it. If we stick our finger into the socket, though, we know it's there. And we know that electricity is very powerful. We cannot see the electric current. We cannot see the air that we breathe without which we cannot live. We cannot literally see the wind itself. But we know the great power that it has. In Zechariah the 12th chapter, verse number 1, the prophet said, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the Spirit within me. God forms the Spirit within us. It is God who has placed our spirit and our soul within man. A while ago we read from the book of Psalms. We read of the heavens being the work of God's hand. Uh, by the way, Zechariah 12, 1 says, And form the spirit of man within him, not me, within him, that is man. That, of course, included Zechariah and all of us. But the soul of man is even a greater creation than the heavens of the universe. Our soul is that important. Our body is a great creation. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 119, verse 14. The human body is very magnificent and intricate in its workings. But yet our souls are much more precious. There are some evidences and indications that you and I have an inward man, a soul, a spirit within us. For example, there is the conscience. Our conscience may disturb us and keep us from sleeping at night. This indicates that we're not merely like the lower creation, the animals. The we can be disturbed in our conscience. Paul said, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. The fact that our conscience may be disturbed or it may feel good when we do what we know God's Word teaches. When we go out and do something and we know it's right, we feel good about that, don't we? Our conscience feels good about it. But if we contradict what the Bible says, we are disturbed. Now the conscience is not the standard. The Bible is. The conscience is like perhaps a gauge on an airplane that the airline pilot follows. It shows it is an indicator, but the indicator is not the standard. The Bible, of course, tells us 
whether we are right and wrong in the things that we do. Another example of the fact that man is more than just a mere animal, that he has an eternal soul, is his ability to reason. Isaiah said in Isaiah 1 verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Man is a rational being. He has the ability to reason things out and to make decisions. He has the ability to make rational decisions, although oftentimes people are irrational in the decisions they make. They're very unwise in the things they do. But yet God has put within us the ability to make the right decisions. In Acts chapter 17, when Paul went to Thessalonica, he went into the synagogue of the Jews there, and the Bible says in verses 2 and 3, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. In other words, he set forth proofs that they were to consider regarding Jesus. They knew the old Scriptures. And he proved from the Scriptures who Jesus is. Verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. He set forth the evidence of the proof, and it was up to them to accept it and to reason and to conclude properly that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. But also man has the ability to feel emotions. People, of course, are rational beings, we have reason, we have the will to do, to act, and then also we can feel, we have emotions. Let's go back to the book of Psalms again, Psalm 39. And as we look at all these things, they indicate that there's more to us than just flesh and blood. We're not just a physical machine walking around, as it were. We have a soul. We have a heart and a mind we can feel. We have a heart, the seat of emotions. In Psalm 39, we see that David expressed the fact that he had emotions that we have, of course. He said, I was dumb with silence, in verse 2. That is, I was speechless. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. He had to hold back, but then he spoke. Yes, yeah, sometimes we hold back, and then we speak. We are to be careful what we speak, to be sure that it's right with God. But man has the ability to feel. These are not physical properties. We laugh. We cry. We feel joy, we feel sadness, we feel happiness and disappointment and heartache, as well as things that lift us up. The philosopher Epicurus, and you know Paul encountered the Epicureans in Athens in Acts 17, 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and, said, and some said, what will this babbler say? They refer to Paul as a babbler. Other, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Well, Jesus is God, not simply a God among many. There's only one God made up of three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Matthew 28, 19. Jesus is the Son. But now these Epicureans, they were of the school of Epicurus, the philosopher. And this is what Epicurus said. While I am, death is not. And when death is, I am not. Therefore, death is no concern to me. Well, Epicurus, of course, Epicurus rather, the father of the Epicureans, of that particular group, 
He was false in this. He felt that when he died, all would be over. That while he is living, while he exists, death is not. But when death is, I don't exist. So I'm not concerned about death. Well, the Hebrews writer says, appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. After death is the judgment. So we do exist after death. We do live somewhere. In Ecclesiastes 12, 7. And the dust shall return to the earth as it was. That's talking about man's body. But the spirit unto God who gave it. Spirit will go to God. And of course, if we have lived for God, our souls will stay with Him. But if we have not, then certainly we will have to depart from God in eternity. But now let's look at some other matters pertaining to the soul. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Here Paul refers to the soul or the spirit as the inward man. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, verse 16, Paul said, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So he speaks in terms of a human being having an outward man and an inward man. And so we don't just have an outward man, just a physical body. I want to come back to that in just a moment. But Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he speaks here of man's soul and body and spirit. He said in verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do have a soul and eternal spirit. But here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 16, Paul speaks of the inward man. That though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The outward man is a physical body. Maybe we have noticed, I have noticed, now at age 58, that physically I'm not what I was at age 25. Have you noticed that too? If you've gotten maybe beyond youth, that your body cannot exactly do what it used to do especially after you get over 40 35 40 years old it's a difference yet yeah, we're thankful we can do what we can we're not exactly what we used to be physically are we the body wears down the outward man is perishing it's just a fact the physical body is perishing it's going to be very uh, sad news for these people that all they emphasize is their skin and their hair and their muscles, their physical body, their figure. That's all they can think about, what I look like or how good I am physically. You know, that's all they seem to dwell on. Well, eventually they're going to have to face the hard, cold facts that this body doesn't stay the same. Neither does our hair or our skin. It doesn't stay the same. Yet the inward man, the soul, is renewed day by day. It's, it gets nearer and nearer and better and better every day. But he's not writing this to people who are outside of Christ. He's writing to Christians. It cannot be said to the child of the world that your inward man is renewed day by day because it isn't. The inward man being renewed and getting better and stronger every day is true of the Christian, the faithful child of God who is growing the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and Him be glory both now and forever. 2 Peter 3.18 Though the outward body is wearing out, the inward man, the soul, the spirit is getting better and stronger and closer to God 
each and every day that we live. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Now let's turn over to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3. Here the apostle Peter, speaking of the women, 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4. And he is saying here not that a woman cannot uh, try to look nice and dress up, but her emphasis is to be on the spiritual, on the inward person. That's where her emphasis is to be, on her soul and what she is before God. Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corrupt, believe in the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. The hidden man of the heart. The heart, certainly, is our inward being, a part of our inward being. The inward man of the heart. The spirit is the knowing part of man. It is that part of us which is conscious and has the ability to know and to learn. If I want to know something, I don't ask my big toe a uh, question. Or my little finger doesn't speak to me and tell me something. That's part of my physical body. But my brain tells my toe and my feet and my hand what to do. The spirit of man is that knowing and understanding part of us. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, Paul used this illustration. And there he is teaching that, the, teaching that the thing that we may know of God is that which God's Spirit reveals to us. And of course, the way that he revealed it is through inspired men of God like Paul and the apostles. And now which we have recorded on the sacred page today, the Bible. That is what the Spirit of God has revealed to us about God. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit, verse 10. But in verse 11 He said, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save that is except the Spirit of man which is in him? So our Spirit knows what's going on in our lives. He said, Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. The only thing that we can really know about God is what God has chosen to reveal unto man through His Spirit, and that in using inspired men who have recorded and completed the Bible. Today we do not have miraculous gifts, including the miraculous gift of inspiration, but we do have inspiration in this book, the Bible. We do have the inspired Word of God to guide us. We know that the spirit, the soul, leaves the body. So there's a distinction there. In James 2, verse 26, James used that illustration. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. When we die, the spirit leaves the body. David taught in the Psalms that the spirit will live forever. In Psalm 22, verse 26, he said, The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Your heart shall live forever. The heart, of course, is part of our inward being, the soul, and sometimes is used to refer to the soul. We know that Peter rebuked Simon of Samaria and he said, Thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Acts 8, verse 21. So we are led to ask the question, Is my heart right with God? I cannot be right with God if my heart is not right with God. My soul, my spirit cannot be right with God unless my heart is. My heart must be right. We know that the spirits that rebelled against God were cast out of heaven. And this shows that everything does not pertain to the physical. We turn over to the book of Jude in verse number 6. 
And the angels which kept not their first estate. And you remember, according to Hebrews chapter 1, that angels are spirit beings. They are spirits. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, they were not satisfied to stay in the realm where God had placed them. They got out of their place. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now let's think in terms of the relation of the soul to God. The soul was given by God. Remember Ecclesiastes 12, 7? The Spirit will return unto God who gave it. As we have read in Zechariah 12, 1, the Spirit was formed within man by the Lord. God himself is Spirit. Jesus said God is a Spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, verse 24. Man was created in the very image of God, according to Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. We note that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 teaches that. But the soul can, and our soul will inherit the kingdom of heaven if we follow Christ and we are faithful unto him. Paul taught the Athenians in Acts 17, 28 that we are his offspring. We are the offspring of God. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9, the Hebrews writer says of God that he is the father of spirits. That is, he created our souls and our spirits within us. God is the creator. He is the father of our spirits. All souls belong to God. Let's turn to the book of Ezekiel and the 18th chapter in verse number 4. Here the prophet Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 18 and verse number 4, Behold, all souls are mine, God says. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God said that all souls are mine. And thus our allegiance should be to God who gave us our eternal souls. We see our spiritual relation to Jesus Christ right now. We turn over to Galatians, the third chapter, beginning at verse number 26. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all the children, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, last of all this morning, my friends, what about the value of the soul? What is the value of the soul? We see that the soul has great value to the body. The soul is the seed of our understanding judgment, affections, will, and intellect. The seed of our consciousness, our memory, our reason, it is where our hope is. It's within us when we have hope in Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27. The hope that we have resides within our souls. When we have hope in our heart, it is in the inward man that we have that hope, is it not? This is where we have faith in the Lord. It's in the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. We know that Jesus emphasized the importance of the soul over the body. When he said, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather destroy him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, Matthew 10, 28. We do all that we can to prevent sickness and death, physically, to preserve our bodies. But yet how much attention are we giving to our eternal soul? Are we striving to grow and to learn and to be faithful so that our souls might be better? 
that we might be prepared for that upper and better place in heaven. The song that we sometimes sing is, I'll live on. I'll live on. Is that talking about our physical body? No flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Our souls, though, will be there. Think about the cries of infidels at death. Thomas Paine was not singing, I'll live on, nor was Voltaire. Voltaire said, I wish I had never been born. Now, we as Christians don't say that, do we? Paul said, my desire is to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Philippians 1, 23. Thomas Paine, who wrote The Age of Reason, said, I would give worlds if The Age of Reason had never been written. The things that he wrote there were contrary to God and to his word. He was sorry that he wrote that. But nevertheless, it had an influence upon man. Jesus Christ said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8, 36, 37. To raise that question is to answer it. But now as we close this morning, who cares for my soul? On one occasion, when David was fleeing from King Saul, he said, No man cared for my soul. Psalm 142, verse 4. But my friends, you and I can be convinced that God does care. Peter said, Casting all your care upon him that is the Lord, for he careth for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son care for our souls. This has been proven, Romans 5, verses 8 and 9. But God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Romans 8, 32, he that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Jesus Christ truly cares. The one who said, Come unto me, and all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. The love, one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelation 1 5. The Spirit cares. The Holy Spirit brought the gospel down from heaven, 1 Peter 1 12. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6 17. The Spirit cares. The church is to care. The Spirit today and the bride, the Spirit and the bride say come. Revelation 22, 17, when we use the Word of God, we are speaking the Spirit's message. In the Gospel of Christ, Romans 1, 16, we invite people to come to Him to be saved, that their souls may live on and on throughout eternity. The soul belongs to God. Thus we are to love God first and to put Him first in everything. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Mark 12 and verse number 30. We are to love the Lord even above our own family. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, Jesus said. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, verse 37 and 38. The principal and most important need in our lives, although physical food and water and shelter and health are important, that's not the most important need that we have. The important need above all others is for the salvation of our souls. Jesus said in Matthew 4, verse 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, that is, by physical food alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what our souls need, yours and mine. 
We need every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God if we want to live, if we want to live spiritually in Christ and live eternally with God in heaven, that is what we must have. The Lord loves us and He cares about us. He proved that by giving Himself. You know also though that God proves His love by His chastening and correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Hebrews 12, 6. The same reason we correct and punish our children whom we love is the reason that God allows us to be chastened and corrected and punished. About 125 A.D., a Greek by the name of Aristides, writing to a friend about Christians, said this, If any righteous man among the Christians passes from this world, they rejoice and offer thanks to God. They is escort his body with songs and thanksgiving as if he were setting out from one place to another nearby. You know, he made a correct observation there, didn't he? It's not to say that uh, where Christians go is right here on this earth nearby, but his observation that when a faithful child of God dies, though we weep for ourselves, we do. But yet there's a sense in which we rejoice. And I want to bring an example of this here at Central. Not long after this congregation started, we had a sister in Christ who started attending here, and she'd gotten off the course, and she repented, repented and prayed to God, confessed her sin. She was restored, and she was faithful to the Lord. And she didn't live for a real long time after that, some months. But she was faithful. She was faithful. And she had been to worship on the Lord's Day before her death. It was believed that even that she passed away, perhaps on Lord's Day evening, Sunday night, after going to worship. Because when they found her the next day, she was in her church clothes sitting at the table. Her body was there at the table in her church clothes. She'd been to worship that Lord's Day evening. I know that we were saddened when she passed away, but we all rejoiced too. Because we knew that the things that she suffered and went through in this life we're not going to be a part of her anymore. And we had the confidence she was going on to a better place. And that's true of each and every one of us, friends. If we're faithful, although it will break our hearts to see one of us to leave, we rejoice over that precious soul. This is what the Bible says. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116, 15. John said, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Revelation 14, 13. Now one reason I'm saying that this morning is because to emphasize the importance of of our soul salvation that we'll be ready to leave this whole world one day each and every one of us because leave we must we're going to leave this world we're going to say goodbye every one of us to this world one day let's be sure friends that we're right with God when we so do in order for our souls to be right with God, the Bible teaches that we must hear and believe the Word of God 
because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And we cannot please God without faith. To come to God, we must have faith. Hebrews 11, 6 teaches that. And we cannot be saved without coming to the Lord. And we must repent. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. And we must confess faith in the Lord. Yes, we must believe the gospel. And that includes believing on Jesus Christ as the Son of God. As the Ethiopian made known his faith, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But that rejoicing did not end when he died. If he was faithful, he continued to rejoice even after he left this earth. If we don't believe that, we don't believe anything the Bible teaches. That if we die in Christ, we don't lose our joy. We have something better to come than this old world. What can we believe in the Bible if we don't believe that? If we don't believe in the hereafter, in that place that our Lord Jesus has gone to prepare for us. My friend, have you done these things that we have taught this morning? Have you done this, but you realize my heart is not right with God. I want to repent and pray God's forgiveness, even today, according to Acts 8.22. If you need to come, we encourage you and we invite you as we stand and we sing.